Perhaps energy could lead to the black swan event that then could have a spillover on the stock market and we would then see a global market crash. You see, energy has to be treated like national security and governments, they need to ensure it. The current energy crisis is particularly bad in Europe. Prices for natural gas, coal and electricity have exploded, leading to protests over household power bills in Spain, just like it did in the 1970s. We are seeing gasoline shortages in Britain and worrying low supplies of natural gas across much of the continent. And as possibly very cold winter is fast approaching across the world. The current energy crisis is particularly bad in Europe. Prices for natural gas, coal and electricity have outright exploded. That has in fact led to protests over household power bills in Spain. 1970s gasoline shortages in Britain and we are seeing worrying low supplies of natural gas across much of the continent. And that when we are possibly seeing a very cold winter fast approaching. The energy crisis is affecting almost every part of the globe and it is marked by record high energy prices, tight supplies and power blackouts. Some of the world's richest countries and the US and the state such as California have been struggling to keep the electricity system stable. Now the first energy crisis in decades has come as a shock to many, even to me and I think to you too and sister Shelley and brother Jamal too, who seem to have forgotten, especially Kitty, how energy insecurity is interconnected with every major sphere of public life. The economy, national security, the environment, and the health. You can't even cook mac and cheese at home without energy. So as the world's most traded good energy is involved in everything we buy and consume. So energy prices and shortages significantly, as they say, impact economic growth. And for that matter, how we live. Because energy is the most important input in manufacturing, stable prices and supplies. They are the key to economic competitiveness. And I would actually say it's key to being alive, right? Electricity and fuels for heating, cooking, transport, they're major items in every household. And price increases disproportionately affect the poor, the pigeons. Similarly, government institutions and infrastructure, they need stable and affordable energy supplies to function, putting public safety and health at risk when electricity suppliers aren't steady. Now, Europe's example can be especially instructive for other countries because no other place has invested so much money and made such policy efforts to reconstruct its energy markets. Yet nowhere have the failures been so great. How did Europe actually create its energy crisis and what are the lessons learned for others? Well, it is a blame game, right? One politician will blame the other and the other will blame the other. And in the end of the day, they both won't be here next year. However, much of the debate over Europe's energy troubles blames either renewable energy or fossil fuels. Depending on one standpoint, in the culture wars which energy and climate policies have been drawn. Now, the critics of reliance on renewables point out their dependence on intermittent wind and sun, which we obviously have been lacking across much of Europe this year. Remember, we didn't have a lot of sun, right? What about the global warming? Anyway, while the proponents point out to the volatility in fossil fuel prices and lower gas imports from Russia. Bad, bad Putin. In reality, Europe's energy policy failures are much more complex and have little to do with the debate over renewable and fossil fuels. Achieving energy security does require carefully balancing market forces, technologies, policies, and geopolitics, which doesn't fit into ideological templates. Now, the truth is that both the right's market ideology and the left's reflexive market suppression have contributed to the current energy crisis. And so you and I, right? We drive our car and we have an air conditioner at home. Now consider how Europe has designed its energy markets. As a part of its energy trade liberalization, the European Union encouraged member states to move to gas delivery contracts based on the daily spot price instead of negotiating 
aiding fixed long-term prices with suppliers such as Russia's Gazprom. Now, this view was based on market ideology more than a thorough analysis of how to achieve security of supply and lower prices. This policy created several negative outcomes. Now, first, relying on spot markets with their daily ups and downs increased Russia's ability to sway gas prices. As Europe's biggest gas supplier with a lot of spare capacity, it can release or limit suppliers and though effectively set prices, bad, bad Russia. In addition, eliminating fixed price contracts mitigates in stable supplies. Natural gas production and new pipelines, they are very expensive, requiring billions of dollars in investments and many years of development. This creates a disincentive for a more diverse set of producers to invest in supplying gas to Europe. However, increasing Russia's power over the market. You see, a factor in the current crisis is Russia's, bad Russia's, unwillingness to re, you know, re-up gas shipments to Europe. So with less gas supplied by pipelines, Europe has had to rely increasingly on imports of more expensive liquefied natural gas. And this is where it competes for shipments with East Asia, which is used to paying much higher gas prices than Europe is. All I know is that in Germany and in Denmark, we pay the highest prices for electricity and energy than anywhere in the world. But okay. So during periods of high demand, Europe has to pay Asian prices for additional supply instead of the cheaper price of pipeline gas from its own regional suppliers. So with European governments mandating a greater share of renewables in the energy mix, utilities are not allowed to select the most economically viable fuel. Moreover, most governments, they limit the electricity and natural gas price that they are allowed to charge consumers. So utilities control neither the prices of fuels nor what they can charge customers. Moreover, because the main renewable source of energy, solar and wind, are highly variable depending on the weather. Utilities must maintain an entire second network of always ready backup power plants using natural gas, coal or other sources in order to ensure a stable electricity supply and prevent blackouts. Now maintaining this spare capacity which sits idle when the sun shines and the wind blows naturally costs a lot of money. This is not paid by the renewable energy producers is now but by the power utilities, which pass those costs on to the public. But let me just remind you, the price of implementing renewable energy also has been passed on to the public. So in response to rising energy prices, governments in the United Kingdom, France, Spain, and elsewhere have stepped in with new price ceilings. So Europe also hasn't resolved how it deals with major spikes in energy demand such as during an extended cold spell, cold winter we're going to see. No price is going to move energy to another market if it requires turning out the lights on one's own people. During a brutally cold winter in early 2010, some European governments ignored contractual obligations to transit gas in order to provide heat to their own publics. With gas supplies at the lowest levels in many years going into the winter, this problem could be bad. As you probably know, I read this article and I got it from one of the mainstream newspapers. I mean, you read it and what do you get out of it? A lot of nothing, right? We are a bunch of pigeons. 